Hi there, my name is Josh, and in order to understand the concept we're going over today, check out the previous video over parity. It's super important and is crucial to understanding what we're going to go over today, which is error correcting code or ECC. So error correcting code is what we use in the server environment. And when I say server environment, I mean any situation in which time is money. This could be running Amazon's uh, point of sale server and that people buy and sell stuff on it. It could mean running a database of healthcare stuff and that we have to pull upon these records all the time in order to do stuff right. Another situation is a lives are at stake and that could mean we are hooking someone up to a heart thing, uh, the, something that keeps them alive and tell them I'm not a medical professional. Or if you are putting people in space and where math and computers are very integral into getting them back here safely. So having error correcting code is very important in these two situations as well as it keeps people alive. So time is money and then keeping people alive. These are great applications for error correcting code and we want to prevent crashes from ever happening in these environments. So what kind of hardware uses error correcting code? It is, like I said, server, server platforms. This could be the Ryzen Threadripper series, the AMD Epic, spelled out E-P-Y-C, or the very famous Intel Xeon series, that's X-E-O-N. So these are very expensive server level chips and they are priced high because they support a lot of features like ECC and a lot of PCI Express lanes. They're designed for special purpose. You don't buy these for your home desktop. So these are the processors that support it, but you also have to have an accompanying motherboard and a chipset that is going to support ECC. And then on top of that, you have to have actual ECC memory modules. And they are built slightly different as there is usually a ninth, ninth chip to the eight chips that we see. And I would ask that you guys go look up those on Amazon after the video, and you'll find that they're actually a little bit more expensive, about 12% more expensive because they're adding that extra chip. Also, they're not making a whole lot. It's um, the server environment is relatively low volume when you compare it to, you know, the, the, the laptops. So from here, we're going to go into explaining how error correcting code works from a mathematical perspective. And then after that, we'll explain IBM's chip kill, which is like a very resilient memory. Let's get on into it. So this was the eight by eight table of data that we had in the previous video. We can see here that there is parity bits. And there is one last thing I forgot to mention in the last video that's kind of important. That's just kind of a cool observation is that for every row, the number of ones is going to be even parity bit included. So one, two, three, four, five, six, that's even. Let's go down to a, a zero is one, two, three, four, that's even. So if we factor in parity and data, everything is going to be even. If something's not even, a parity error has occurred. And you know that's a way you can find out. So we see here that I factored up the parity bits for each row and through a process called Hamming code, uh, developed by Richard Hamming about 60 or 70 years ago, we're going to see how we can detect and correct errors. And it's actually pretty simple. Uh, if you look up Hamming code, you'll get some really complex charts and like people love drawing squares, but this has been my example to use to explain to people is arrange your bits in a row and then also arrange your parity bits in the columns. And why would we ever want to do that? Well, you'll see in a second here. So I'm gonna factor up the parity bits for every column. So now that we have the parity for the top row, or the parity for this row, let's change some bits because that's what happens in real life. Um, I'm gonna take this one and we're gonna make it a zero. Now, you guys can see that I changed the one, but on a hardware level, we can't see when this stuff changes. We can only rely on parity and then error correcting code to fix it. So if I was to factor up the parity for this row, one, two, three, four, 
uh, there's something wrong. So something's, something's wrong here. I can tell that by the parity bit. And then if we also looked at the column for this, we're going to say one, two, three. Well, that, that's a zero. That should be a one. So that's, that's also something wrong. And logically, we can just say, hey, let's split this bit. This will correct our two errors. And that's how we correct a memory error that has occurred. Now, this particular type of Hamming code is single error correcting and then double error detecting. And I'll show you double error detecting here. So an example of double error detecting and that we can't correct it is, let's say I change this to a zero. Well, the parity for this one is now well, that's not, that's no longer flagged. That's kind of awkward. But this has a parity error that occurs here. If two parity errors are occurring in the rows, I can no longer detect it in the same column. And that, this will just tell us that two bits are wrong. And we don't know what bit in this row is wrong because the parity bit for this now checks out. There's now an even number of ones in there. So, so this went from, you know, if we had one error, we could correct it. Now we have two errors. We can't really detect it in this column, but we are able to detect it in the rows and we can still inform the computer that something has happened and something went wrong. So having a two bit error, how likely is this to actually occur? Not likely at all. 98% roughly of all memory errors are single bit errors. That means that only one thing in this has changed. Two bit errors are the 2%. So the likelihood of, of a two bit error occurring is very small. You got to consider that if a one bit error occurs, we're going to detect it, you know, that moment, that instant, or, uh, you know, we, we can scrub through the data pretty often to make sure that the reliability and the integrity of that data is maintained. Two bit errors have to occur at the same time for that to happen. So I have to flip this bit and this bit at the same exact point in time. And that is very unlikely in, the, in, a, in a real world environment. So I flipped a bit here and a parity error occurs here and it occurs here. Now what piece of actual hardware decodes this and looks at it and say, hey, there's a problem here. Let's flip that bit and correct it. Well, that is the memory controller on your processor. And that memory controller has to have support for ECC. And like I said earlier, we're only going to see that on some higher level server ones like Threadripper or Xeon or Epic. And it's going to correct it on the fly. And if a lot of these occur, it'll say, hey, something's wrong with your memory. But this whole process is normally just transparent to the operating system. Um, if we have a double bit error occur, a parity flag might be flipped and the operating system will be like, hey, something's wrong, let's, let's fix it. So two acronyms that we have are SEC and DED, single error correcting, and then there's double error detecting. I said that enough, but there's also higher levels of this as well. So we'll have, sometimes we'll have double error correcting and triple error detecting. Now, how would we have triple error correcting or quadruple error detecting? I'm not gonna go over that in great detail here, but I am going to link a paper in the description by Richard Hamming, published in 1950. It was such a lovely read for me, um, explaining that basically the more bits we add, the more parity bits we add to a word, the better data reliability and da data integrity we can have. So this is a memory module and it has eight things on it. This is non-ECC. And what would happen if one of these chips was to fail? Well, that could be very bad. And, you know, like I said earlier, if we're sending someone to space or running a large multi-billion dollar company, well, that's pretty bad. So IBM actually developed a technology called chip kill. And that chip kill allowed for one of these chips to fail and the system to still run. And I want to explain that a little bit briefly. We don't see it nowadays because ECC... In, in the normal sense of single error correcting, double error detecting has worked and um, just the demand for that really isn't there. And if you were sending someone to space, I'm sure you could develop your, you know, a custom system for that. So IBM chip kill 
it will actually separate the data in a way that allows one of those chips to fail. And we're gonna explain that here. It is called RAID 3. And yes, this is exactly like the RAID levels we see in storage systems, but this is being implemented on the, um, the RAM memory short-term storage level. So RAID 3, it simply says that for every A data plus a B data, we have a we have a corresponding C data that's created that describes the relationship between these two pieces. And now if this were an actual memory chip, this will be you know chip one, chip two, chip three. Um, so one, two, three. And then we're gonna say like A plus that goes to three. And just doing this from an algebraic standpoint, we can see that if I take out two, so one plus a number equals three, well, we can just assume that that's two and that is our data. This is how chip kill works on the very hardware level. And we will see that this data is actually spread out on some chips. I'll draw an example here. So this is an example of a memory module and say we put A here and then B here, and then we put C here. And then we can put um, A2 here, B2, C2, and, and so on. Um, it's, it's the idea of a staggered layout. So if I take this out entirely, we no longer have a B, we don't have a C2. Well, I have A and C, so I can, I can create a B using my memory controller. And that, that while that data is not actually there, we can recreate it on the fly, which is super cool. And then I also had a, uh, well, I have an A2 and a B2, so I can probably make a C2 out of that. Not that I really need to, the C2 is just the parity data, but it's really important to have data reliability. And if, if, this, if this situation were to happen where, a, where a, a chip would die, then you could still run your system. So that gives an example of how IBM chip kill works. It's super cool, and sadly it's not really made anymore. It stopped about 2009, but is a really great example of data reliability and integrity. And if you're gonna learn about ECC, you should definitely learn about some, some more novelty things like this. And then also that Hamming paper, which is gonna explain the triple error correcting, quadruple error detecting, and so on, and describing how we can implement extra parity bits to detect and correct data that might go wrong. Now, all these concepts about ECC and parity, it doesn't just apply to RAM, it also applies to communications and hard drive storage. So this has been error correcting code. I hope you guys have a better understanding of how it works and how it's implemented and why it's implemented. And I would ask that you go look up some examples on Amazon of ECC memory. Try to compare the cost. You'll find that it's at least 12% higher due to the extra chip and then, you know, they make less of it. So naturally it costs a bit more for what it is. And then I also really suggest that you guys look up the Richard Hamming paper. I will include a link in the description. That paper has really helped me understand ECC and just the, the core concepts behind this. So thanks for watching. Leave a like, subscribe, join me on this adventure as we learn about memory and then just computers as a whole. Thank you. Bye.